That's a popular question that I'm asked uh, pretty much daily, okay? And there, there's the expectation was we'd get the permit, we'd dig up some treasure, we'd all be happy, okay? That's still my expectation, all right? All right, however, when you practice good archaeology, and we do, when we got our permit, which was a pretty big deal getting that and getting it done, when, when we got that, one of the things we adhere to is the archaeology. And part of the archaeology on this site uh, is laying down grid work. Uh, and then on top of the grid work, you do side scan sonar. And there's certain prep work that you do that's required that we could not do until we actually received the permit. So that work has been completed. In addition to that, when the Sea Searcher was originally designed, it was originally designed with the Melbourne Beach site in mind. And in the Mel Melbourne Beach site, you really don't have very much current. And so we designed the Sea Searcher so that it could swim anywhere it wanted to go in that area, north, south, east, west, etc. However, when we go down to Juno Beach, there is up to a six knot current from the Gulf Stream and there's 90 feet of water uh, in, in parts of our site. Now, what we've had to do is make tremendous modifications to the Sea Searcher for this particular application. And what we've done is we've taken the tether off of the Sea Searcher uh, that goes to the surface, that goes to a buoy that has the antenna and computing power, etc. And we had to make uh, these modifications so that we could just physically take the sea searcher down to the bottom and then we could do a complete scan of the bottom. We want to prove to the world that one, we have a very productive site, two, the sea searcher works, three, the team of experts that we've put together both in archaeology and scientific uh, team is just awesome. And, and that's going to be reflected, and that's all part of the plan. So I want to get out there as much as any shareholder we have, okay? And, uh, and to have the patience uh, to do this and do it right, uh, sometimes is a fairly tough thing. But now we've done all the modifications, we've done our testing, uh, and so hopefully in the not too distant future, we will have it down there, we will scan our site, it takes several days to scan the site, you can't just do it overnight. Uh, and then when we complete that, uh, we will then uh, begin our investigation of the site and actually uh, start our exploration and, and uh, excavation. Now that's probably the second most popular question I'm asked. Kyle, what's happened to the price movement? You know, we, we saw it go from under a penny to three cents and back down to a penny and it, it's bouncing around. And, and, and there's, there's several things, but the basic principle is the same all the time, and that's supply and demand. And there was a point in time when I met, went uh, several weeks ago um, up and I met with several uh, angel investors. And those people had never heard of Seafair before. Uh, but once they did hear of Seafair and they understood our concept that we've invented equipment that can see in 3D gold and silver under the sand when nobody else in the world has done that and they realized that there are thousands and thousands of these wrecks and that some of these wrecks carried tonnage and gold and silver and then obviously the jewels, emeralds, etc. Once they were able to figure out their math, it was like, hey, if you've invented this, you can repeat this process and you can do it over and over. And because they're smart people, they bought the stock. And I think they're pretty sh sharp for doing that. And, and so as they bought it, they created an imbalance in the supply and demand. The supply remained the same, but the demand went up. Now, as that price got to three cents, a lot of investors, also savvy investors that are smart, they had bought the stock when we were two tenths of a penny, three tenths of a penny, and now they're talking three cents. That's enough to stimulate some 
shareholders into selling a position or selling part of their position and, and, and taking some of the risk off the table. And when you're talking about uh, smaller cap stocks, you get a lot of volatility. And because there's not huge volume uh, in, in most of the, the smaller cap stocks, then when you get an upset in demand uh, or you get more sellers, then you're going to have that swing in price. And it's just real simple. If you got more buyers, you go up. If you got more sellers, you go down. And, uh, and we've experienced that. We will experience that again in the future. Uh, that's just part of being a stock. And so, you know, I'm appreciative of the people who are long-term investors uh, like myself. And hopefully I will reward them the way I want to be able to reward them. Because uh, what's good for them is good for me.